does seem to me this is this is the most interesting city in America. The kind of future that we will build is not in the cars. It's not any longer because of our location in the East Texas oilfields. We always knew how Houston was doing in the 60s and 70s because you had the huge tool brick count. Right? The number of bricks and how and remember, Houston's future is up to this generation. How we really, how well we address those critical questions. So. Um, I don't know. If, uh, I don't have. I don't know what to. to, to I, I've, got, I've got a PowerPoint of, of the new findings from this year's survey, yeah. and this has been a particularly interesting survey. And you've got. Can, let's see if we can put a. Can we use a PowerPoint? Yep. Yeah. Uh, every year, the surveys have been interesting and important. I think in various ways as we see, but more clearly this year than I think ever before, trends that we were watching seem to have taken a kind of a sea change in the way that I want to share with you. Before we do that, questions, thoughts about the film? Uh, I just wondered about the, the DVD. Is it, uh, can we get it? Is it successful? Yeah, online? so we haven't figured out what to do with this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have an official public release of the film this Friday oh. at Discovery Green. Oh. Oh. I'd love to bring you copies of it. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Oh. I'm not sure how many people are going to go to Discovery Green to hear a sociologist talking about data. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell my friends I'll bring some more. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, the mayor's going to be there, and Bill Lawson is going to speak, and, and Irma that? Diaz, and, it's, and, it's, and there's going to be music, and it's, it's called uh, Interesting Times Celebrating the Possibilities. It's, it starts at 6.30, Discovery Green. Discovery Green? It's open to the world. Uh, and there are going to be booths and, and music and dancers. And then as it, when it gets dark at around 8 or 8.30, we'll show the film and then answer questions and talk about uh, the film and find the circuit. And then once that's done, then the film's available. Then anybody, if anyone would like the film, you should go to kinder.rice.edu or email kinder at rice.edu and, and tell us what you want. If you, if you just want to see the film yourself, we can send you a link. If you want to show it to some group, uh, we will send it to you, but we ask that you tell us what group that is, and we want to sort of keep track of, of who's, who's going to see. But if there are groups you'd like to show the film to, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Well, you bet. Yeah, and, you know, it was, the idea was, look, tweet guys, film me giving this talk, so, because I get so many requests for talks, and so sort of send that out, and, and then they did that, and they said, boy, you know, we could turn this into a theater-ready film. Uh, and ExxonMobil, We've been working with us on other things. Said, "Here's twenty-five thousand dollars. Show us what you can do." And so that's what, so. It's really is a better. And, 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 yeah, I hope you. She watched it. It's an awful lot of heavy things yeah. people hear, <laughs> but it really does. I think. I can't think of anything. That's fine. Yes, sir. Right. Um, you referenced the HISD, ethnicity, and poverty figures. Have you looked at how the outline suburban districts have also changed character? You bet. Yeah, so that's one of the Because I don't ever hear you talk about it, but I know it's changed. Well, we've been doing Harris County every year, but starting this year, and from now on, we are reaching the 10 county area. And, there's, and we have to do that. You know, there's that 2, 4, 6 rule, right? Harris County is about 2 million people. I'm sorry, Houston, the city of Houston is about 2 million people. Harris County is about 4 million people. And the rainy Houston, the Chevalier area, there's 10. 10 county area that spreads over 10,800 square miles, larger than the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. contains its Because I think it would be interesting when you talk to, when people talk about wanting those suburban homes, they assume they're in a good suburban school district. A lot of the suburban school districts look a lot more like HST than they think. That's right. That's right. Let me, uh, okay, well, I've got a lot of, let me, let me, why is it this room? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Along the same lines, if you're taking, if you took HISD as a measure of the ethnicity of kids in Houston, is that, is that half done? Right, that's, and, and it says children of Houston, but I was talking about HISD, so, so that's much more than elsewhere, but as you're saying, it's, it's happening. Let me, let me show you some of the demographics. First. This is, this is the thing that they, I want, they, they filmed me for four hours, and then they grabbed, took this to me. <laughs> <laughs> said, we're not going to show numbers, we're going to show sizes of names, right? So, so this is the actual numbers. Let me see, do I have the, let me get a, a, a pointer class. The, uh, this is the census figures for each of the last six decades. And, and here we go in this biracial world, I'm sorry, this is quite, biracial world of 
1.2 million people in 1960, 74% of us were Anglos, 20% African Americans, 6% Hispanics, that's in one half of 1% were Asians. I tell everybody we know who those Asians were. That's the G family. <laughs> and they all came here from Mississippi for some reason. <laughs> and then during the oil boom, you see it was the Anglos pouring into the city. By 1980, we became the fourth largest city in America, 63% Anglo. Harris, the Anglo population grew by 22 to 27% between 1970 and 1980. Then came the oil bust, it grew by 1% by 1990, dropped by 6%, dropped again by 5% between 2000 and 2010. Meanwhile, all the rough has been on Anglo growth. And today, Harris County is the most ethnically, you know, the city, the, Harris, the greater Houston metropolitan area is the most ethnically diverse metropolitan area in the country. We passed New York in the census of 2010 in having, which the central measure of ethnic diversity is how equal are the divisions among the four great communities of America. And we have, we are 8% Asian, 41% Latino, 18% African American, 33% Anglo. And, and that's a remarkable eagerness. We are all minorities. We are called on to build something new out of this sun, a truly successful, inclusive, united, multi-ethnic society that will be Houston, and Texas, and America. 2040 to 2045, the entire population of the United States will look like Houston was today. So one of the things you can say to the world is, this is where the American future is going to be working. It's here first. And how we navigate this transition will have real significance for the kind of America that we can build in the 21st century. Considering the groups that have shrunk and the groups that have increased, does that mean that Harris County is uh, significantly poorer than it used to be? It's Challenge tremendous. It's a very, very good point. I mean, could, there's a, my colleague Steve Murdoch, uh, head now of the Hobby Center for, for the Study of Texas, who used to be the state demographer, wrote a very powerful book that he's revised called The Texas Challenge. It says precisely that. If this is, we're about four years ahead of Texas, so this is just really where all of Texas is, is heading much more rapidly. If we don't change the demographic connecting between educational achievement and, and ethnicity, if we, if, we, if we just simply project that the levels of education for Latinos and African Americans and then watch the populations change, Texas is going to be uh, massively less affluent, less capable of, of functioning effectively in the 21st century. The challenge is now to turn, to turn those, those, those equations around. And, and Houston, especially, I'll get to that in just a second. I want to show you this. Uh, one of the new things we got here is uh, GIS map. Oh, well, oh, we have here's it. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> this, okay, okay. Yeah. Mm. All these things I love to talk about. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is Harris County in 1980, and in, in <coughs> red are the counties that the, 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 the census tracts that are predominantly over 50 percent. So the, the, the census tracts that are, predominantly, that are predominantly Anglo in black are the census tracts that are predominantly African American. This is, of course, the third ward and the fifth ward. Uh, census tracts in brown that are predominantly Latino. This is the Segundo Barrio right along the ship channel. And then a very few counties, very few census tracts like, that were predominantly, uh, that had no majority. Okay, we on that? So keep your eye on this map. This is 1980. And keep your eye on this, that never changes the hyper segregation. African Americans in the third ward and the fifth ward. And, and then watch the Latino population spread in terms of census tracts of majority Latino. Here it is in 1990. Here it is. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know the name. 1990, 2000. Wow. And here it is today. Wow. Isn't that where, where do you go if you're an Anglo looking for? <laughs> <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that amazing? I mean, this is who we are. This is what has happened demographically in the last three years. I've heard, I'm living in the Woodlands area, uh -huh. and I've heard that it is now like, what, 60 something percent? This is yeah. Have you, do you have numbers on like that? I, I, I do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the census data from 2000, 2010 for the four largest counties around. And this comes back to the question before. This is Fort Bend County, which is the single most ethnically diverse county in America. Fort Bend County is 19% Asian, 
24% African American, I'm sorry, 24% Latino, 21% African American, 36%. Uh, and what's interesting is Mokirchi in Montgomery County, that was 81% Anglo in 2000, added Anglos, and is now only 71% Anglo. So the story for all the surrounding counties is that the Anglo population dropped in Harris County and grew by only about 5 to 7% in the surrounding counties, but every one of the surrounding counties increased faster than the Anglo population. And so you've got this, so this, this transformation is happening first in the city, then in the county, is now spreading everywhere. And that's the essence of uh, so I'm going to well let me finish one thought about the about, about the uh, uh, about the demographics, and then I'll come back to I think the most the most striking finding in the survey that I think is particularly relevant to the work of Houston tomorrow, and, and that most of you are involved. I'll come back to it in one second. But this was so this is ethnicity by age. This is controlling uh, weighting this weighting the system. So that 78 percent who are over the age of 60 was in our sample of actual people we talked to. But we, the people who will talk to us on the telephone, are more likely to be old whites than young Latinos. <laughs> so we wait. So we now, from now on, will wait the wait the data so that it will reflect the actual demographics of the community, and so that today, over half of everybody over the age of 65 is Anglo, and and this is correct, right? Every, more than three fourths of people under 30. So there is, so this is, there is no force in the world that is going to stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more Latino, more African American, more Asian, and less Anglo as a 21st century thought. Nothing in the world can stop that. So the only question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we make it work? How do we ensure? And, and as I said in that film, this this is the great moment. This transformation can be the greatest asset that a city like Houston could have. Or it could end up even reducing our, our competitiveness in the global economy and becoming a major global rate. And there's that phenomenon called that psychologist study called the psychology of inevitability. And they study this in conjunction with which were the southern towns that desegregated successfully with minimum minimum conflict after the Supreme Court decision in 1955. And what were the southern towns that fought it to, the, to the death? And they concluded the difference was those towns that accepted that there was nothing they could do to stop it. Managed to make that transition beautifully. So those that thought they could turn this around and stop the Supreme Court and impeach Earl Warren or whatever. And the psychology of inevitability says that there's something happening in my world that I would not have chosen. That is not something I'm entirely happy with. But I come to understand it's here and there's nothing I can do to change it. It triggers in the human psyche Maybe this is not such a terrible thing. Maybe we can make this work. Maybe I can make money off of this. <laughs> we have a sense in Houston that we are reaching that point. And here are just a few signs of that. We have asked over all the years, how would you rate the relations among ethnic groups in the Houston area? Excellent, good, fair, poor. They go up and down. And 2008 was a particularly difficult year, especially for Latinos. But in every community, more people than ever before say ethnic relations are excellent. Anglos have always thought everything was hunky dory. <laughs> and, 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 and African Americans have always been by far the most sanguine. And they've got a lot of things that only in my community. But higher ratings than ever before in the surveys. Of that question, another question we asked, we said, do you think the increasing ethnic diversity in Houston will eventually become a source of great strength for this city or will it not? And the presenters say it's going to be a source of great strength is higher than it ever has been before. We reached that point also two years ago, and it's at 71%. Really quite striking. And here is a couple of other uh, indicators. This is support for illegal immigration. And the antagonism toward illegal immigrants has subsided dramatically. This, this question was the large number, we asked every other year, 08, 10, and 12, large numbers of, of undocumented immigrants have been coming into the Houston area. How serious a problem do you think that is for the city? And the presenter said either somewhat serious or not a problem uh, versus very serious. The presenter said it's not a very serious problem. <coughs> 43 to 51 to 63% today. The survey was completed in the middle of March, just a, just a, a month ago. Uh, and then this question was in favor of the granting illegal immigrants a path of legal citizenship if they speak English and have a criminal record. Again, higher than it has ever been. And then uh, it's about as high as it can get in, in support of the DREAM Act. I mean, what, how could you be against the DREAM Act? These are people who came here as kids, did everything we asked of them, are graduated from college, served in the military, 
Never will you be allowed to work in this country. We're going to throw you back to where you belong. I mean, just crazy that you cannot get that passed. And, and, and what I'm telling people is there is, more, there, is, there is more politically feasible today than it has been in a very long time to have comprehensive, intelligent immigration reform. To move us finally into having a rational immigration reform. Uh, and, and part of it is, I don't know if you saw in the paper a couple, a couple of days ago, is the Pew Hispanic Research Center has, indi has, has shown immigration has stopped in the last five years, and in the last year has reversed. More Mexican immigrants left the United States to go back to Mexico than immigrants in Mexico left to come to the United States. So the, the, that anxiety about immigration was still there, is beginning to subside, and, and you've, got a, you've got a community and they increasingly recognize that this is who we are in the 21st century. So I think there's a, it's one of those moments that perhaps we can take advantage of. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you had this kind of question back 20 years or so, whether there's any correlation between the uh, xenophobic nature of the national political party in the White House and people's attitudes. Yeah, on, 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 yeah. I mean, in Republican yeah. regimes, do you get a different attitude about illegal immigration than when you have well, I mean, if anyone was following the, the Republican debates, you know, it was just who can be more anti, anti the Republican Party, of course, is in a very real bind here. I mean, they, they've got to mobilize their base, which is overwhelmingly old white men who, are, who want my country. They're just very worried about all these changes. And the most powerful predictor in our surveys of, of positive attitudes toward immigration, and positive attitudes toward ethnic diversity in general, comfort with diversity, the single most powerful predictor among Anglos is age. Younger Anglos are just, what's the big deal? And older Anglos have much, much more. And it's a famous uh, fundamental law of human nature. What I am familiar with feels right and natural, but I'm unfamiliar. So it's, that's a big part. Their problem is they got to mobilize the base, but they're not going to win elections for very, very much further if they're viewed as the anti-immigrant, the anti-Latino party. And so I think this may be the last election when you'll see Republicans arguing for rounding up the 11 million people and sending them home. <coughs> and, and you might, in fact, already begin to see some moderate it's going to be interesting, interesting to see. In the 1990s, in your surveys, uh, people were more accepting of immigrants. And that changed. I'm not sure. Did we ask enough questions back in the 90s and immigration? I'm not sure that's the case. I remember. Really? But I, I lived in the doctor. Well, they're very accepting. Certainly, it, it's always been a distinction between immigrants and illegal immigrants. Uh, and now there's less distinction. I mean, people in, in Harris County, in that in why outside county, by the way, there's more anti-immigrant attitudes, much more creative than in Harris County. And a big part of that is that they're also more dramatic in the Anglos. And, 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 and the Anglos in the outside counties are more anti-immigrant than the Anglos in, in Harris County, who are more anti-immigrant than the Anglos in, in the city of Houston. But let me, I want to quickly just do two quick things to get on the table the key findings of this year's survey. This is just uh, something we talked about in the, in the film. This is the ratings of job opportunities that went down to 35 and then jumped up this year. New positive feelings about job opportunities in Houston. The unemployment rate, and this is a striking sort of correspondence between the official unemployment rates in Harris County in each of the decades and the percent of our respondents each year who say job opportunities are lousy when we fear a poor, right? The, the wisdom of crowds that have followed you. And you can see what happened here. The unemployment rate in 2010 was 8.6 in Harris County, 8.4 in 11. February of 2012 was 7.3. One percentage point better than the rest of the nation, a significant drop, and the percent saying job opportunities are lousy dropped from 61 to 51. So a more positive feeling about the overall economy, but has not affected the lives of individual Houstonians at all. Here is uh, what would you say is the biggest problem with Houston? This is, of course, um, the big jump of, of, of the economy, and then the economy went down, came back up here, and then this big jump with a big recession from 08 to 09, and then has stayed high. The preoccupation still is the economy. Uh, this is how you're actually doing financially. You're doing better, about the same or worse. Dropped down to 20% in, in, in 2010 at the depths of the recession, the worst, the lowest percent saying that they've been doing better in the past. Coming back up to 28%, now at 27 no change. 
Uh, and then here, more people today than ever before. Yes, people with children. Did you have any difficulty with that last year? Buying the groceries that you did for them. Thirty-two percent of all Harris County residents, with all this vaunted recovery, said they had difficulty buying the groceries that you did. We talked to people at the, at the Houston Food Bank. You will get confirmation. People, it, it is that, that uneven times of rising tide no longer lifts all boats. Some of us benefit enormously from economic recovery. Lots of us are absolutely untouched in our opportunities and our experiences. And so it's a powerful reminder. And then you see in our surveys, um, this is uh, support for government program. Most people, the poor people in America today are poor because of circumstances they can't control. has gone up significantly over the years. A big jump from 45 to 59 percent this year in this stark statement that said, do you agree or disagree? Government should take action to reduce the income differences to rich and poor in America jumping to 59%. Uh, and then uh, another question we asked this year, do you think people receiving welfare are, are taking advantage of the system or, or are really in need of help? And the percent saying they really need help jumped from 30 to 41%. So it's a recognition that this is the central political challenge. We've got to find a way to ensure that all Americans can share in the prosperity of the city in a way, at a time when, you know, think back to the big employers in Houston in the 1970s was huge to Cameron Ironworks, good blue collar jobs, you didn't need a lot of education, good jobs waiting for you to come out of high school, to drop out of high school, and go. those jobs are gone. Right? We're, in world, we're in a world of growth. It's a global economy, companies can produce goods anywhere, sell them everywhere. If you're doing a job that I can program a computer to do, that's what I'm going to do. We are watching in America increasing productivity on the part of companies, and no increase in growth. And it's the central political challenge as we go forward. And then the other piece that I really want to talk about is this is this growing awareness of the quality of quality of place issues. If we're going to be successful, the city has to become a much more beautiful and exciting and interesting place than it is today. We're not going to attract the talent that will grow the businesses in the 21st century uh, if people still keep saying, yeah, why would you want to live in Houston? And there are two critical things I think that are happening. One is, I mentioned in the film, this Bayou Greenway initiative. If we can do that, it's going to cost about a half a billion dollars. $500 million to, to make linear bikeways and, and jogging trails and green spaces <coughs> along the 10 bayous of Houston. That would be Bayou City. Uh, and, and then link those bike trails with bike lanes in the city so that you can bike to work and give you showers and uh, into the places you, you get. If people are talking about this could be the transformative event for Houston in the next 10 to 15 years. And so that's really, and the other piece of it is this striking new interest in walkable urbanism. I, I mentioned in the film, I shock that 41% of everybody in Harris County, Texas, this entire spread out county, all of us driving cars, and 41% said, I would prefer to live in a more urbanized home within walking distance of shops and workplaces. And here's the figures today. Oh, this is, this is just the, systematic support for mass transit. However you ask the question, this was how important you think it is for the future of Houston and major improvements in mass transit systems in Houston. 56% say very important, only 8% say not important. Uh, should, should we continue to, to spend 25% of metro funds for road repairs and other non-metro, uh, non-transport purposes, or should all of metro's money be spent on trans and impro transit improvements? 55% say stop what we're now doing, spend it all on transit. When you last asked that question, a different kind of question in 1999, do you agree or disagree, are, are you in favor or opposed to uh, for, uh, um, using metro funds for non -metro, for, for, for street improvements and other non-metro projects? The majority of, of people in 1995 were absolutely in favor of that. Today, a reversal, right? Stop doing what we're now doing, spend it on transit. And then if we, uh, how should we spend our transportation money? It's 51 percent saying spend it on improving roads and rails and, and roads and Rails, of, rails and buses, and 44% said expand the existing highways. And then we said, hey, did you by any chance use the metro rail? And 61% said, no, I didn't. But it's only seven miles and it doesn't go where I want to go. But 64% um, said they haven't used the rail in the last year. I mean, I asked that question two years ago. So there's some, and then the other thing that's not surprising, I guess, is that those who never use the rail are just as adamant that we should improve transit as those who do. And of course, that's that fundamental. I want you guys on transit. <laughs> <laughs> but then here's, here's the, 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 the So it's two things that we've been tracking. 
We have asked people who live in the city, or since 1999, how many of you would you be in Sunday morning in the suburbs? And people who live in the suburbs, how many of you would be in Sunday morning in the city? And this is just for angles, which is sort of the clearest picture. When we first asked that question in 1999, twice as many people in the city said, I want to someday move to the suburbs, and people in the suburbs saying, I would like to move to the city. And today, it's reversed. Right. More people in the suburbs say, I would like someday to live in the city, than people in the city saying, I would like to someday move to the suburbs. Striking. And these are Anglos, and it's powerful. And then here is the big surprise. This is a is actually 39% when you do the waiting. Last year, 39% said, I want a smaller home in a more, a smaller home in a more urbanized area within walking distance of shops and workplaces. 58% said, thank you very much, I'll stick with my single family home in the big yard, even though I have to need to, need to drive most of the places I need to, I, even if I need to drive most of the places I want to go, look at it today. 51% now say, I want to live in a more urbanized home within walking distance of shops and workplaces. And only 47% say, I want to keep living. Romance with the automobile is ending. You can see that I see it in my students. You know, when I grew up, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license, and all my friends and I knew the name makes of every single automobile, what they're positive and negative traits. We used to go on Sunday drives. No one thinks the car is this wonderfully, it's this terrible necessity, and traffic is getting worse, congestion, uh, the cost of gasoline. And meanwhile, the cities, downtown Houston, town centers at Sugar Land and, and the Woodlands are becoming more and more church. And you can see the city. I think this is a kind of sea change where we want to tell all the builders and, and, and road guys, look, we're not telling people how they should live. What we're saying is that Houston ought to offer for them a choice. And it ought to recognize that the majority of people today no longer want to live in a single way of being able to live. You have to have two cars and you have to drive. And the reason in part is the other is the demographics. In the 1960s and 70s, about 68% of all households had children at home. We have children at home, and we've all had the propaganda, they need to have yards. <laughs> uh, today, less than a third of all households in America have children at home. Less than a third. 22% are single people living in their own households. A whole bunch of us are empty nesters. The kids are there, and, and we're still out there driving and mowing along. And a whole other bunch of us are young creatives, the dinks, right? Double income, no kids. <laughs> and now they're talking about these guys are working so hard, we ought to call it dins. Double income, no sex, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's, it's really interesting. I mean, David Crosley's message that for, for 30 years, this is the way we should be thinking of growing, now it does seem to resonate in a way that we have never seen before. So, so, and especially the last three times, prior to your arrival, we were talking about the quarter of the transit tax are going yes. for uses other than metro and bus. And, uh, I'm curious as to how this year's survey and or the movie we saw is being offered to and or presented directly to the Houston City Council, the Metro Board, the 30 cities that comprise Metro. I mean, is there a... Well, that's what our hope is, to have this film be much more widely available that way. Well, and I am, I am, I, am, I will be giving a talk to the entire city council, I mean, all their staffs. They're, they're, they're going to be in, the, in the, it's going to be done in the, in the, um, the new movie, House of Sunday, Sunday. Theater called Sundance Theater. Sunday. 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 And they're all going to, so the, there's a real chance for them, that I'm going to emphasize this. Look, guys, this, you want to know what your constituents are asking? And, it's, and, and there will be another one million people moving into Harris County, Texas in the next 20 years. They're going to live everywhere. So you can tell the guys who are committed to the, to, we're not going to be able to stop David Crosley and all of some of the rest of us to the contrary notwithstanding, we're not going to stop the super business. What do you call that? Not so grand. Well, yeah. That's going to happen. Uh, and people are going to move out there. But more and more people are also going to so we, and I, I think we've got to basically make the claim for choice. And we want to make sure that there are options for people still who want to live out in the suburbs, but we want above all, we were trying to figure out, maybe you can help me with this, you know, 41% now, 52% who say, I want to live in a more urbanized home within walking distance or shops and workplaces. What percent of Houstonians have that choice today? And we figured maybe 5%. 
can have that trip. And, and now, of course, we're adding 30 miles of light rail. All this goes through well. In fact, there will be, what is it, 65 transit stops in the light rail system. You guys are all making these plans for pedestrian-friendly little villages with, with wide sidewalks and sidewalk cafes and retail downstairs and residents upstairs. And, and if I could get you to live within, within a quarter mile of a transit stop, and the transit takes you anywhere near where you want to go, and one of the things that you guys have shown so powerfully is that the plans for Metro are brilliant. They really link the most important centers of activity within a loop, loop six thing. Exactly where most people will need to go. And you link those, and you've got the transit-oriented pedestrian opportunities, and you can begin to imagine a, a new city providing those options to that 41, now 50%. <laughs> Has there been any discussion of the Z word or talking about Ooh. taking it uh, Ooh, one step further beyond the public realm of, <laughs> <your time>. of <laughs> transit? And, I mean, transit and values are great, uh, of course, but uh, has there been any discussion internally uh, at, at the so. Institute about land use and, and zoning and yeah, development and control? Because, <clears throat> you know, creating the kind of urban and quality of life that you're talking about in terms of, you know, walkable neighborhoods and streets and ca sidewalk cafes and I mean, we've, we've essentially, you know, kind of legis you legislated I ourselves out of that. Right. So. I think that's a great. And the last place in the world you want a high rise is the corner of this and that in Ashby. It's going to be, what, 26 yeah. stories? Yeah. 23 stories? Yeah. Two, 260 units, each with two additional cars, and it's a two lane street. Yeah. No, you want those high rises within a quarter mile of the transit stop. Uh, we don't have something. Have you ever asked the question, or would you? Oh yes, you asked the question of the public, and they all are in favor. The majority are in favor of planning, and and I uh, forget the exact wording for use for for the control of the uses of the land in the city. And sixty percent, of course, you should control. Question about uh, Houston doesn't have a, a general plan. Would you be in favor of the a general plan to guide Houston's future growth? Seventy eight, eighty percent. Of course, I'm in favor. successful, we've got to provide those options for people who are attractive. Um, kind of a little bit unrelated, but um, you said it's 10 counties that you surveyed. Mm -hmm. uh, are they all the ones touching or is counting that Walker? It's, it's a, the census that declares that 
that, is that, does that include Austin County and San Jacinto County yeah. that have 25,000 people or something? Right? It's just, uh, but, but the, I don't think it includes Colorado County. It doesn't. Yeah, that's yeah, Matagoda, Matagoda, Watson, and Colorado. Yeah, that's too far out. The three of them are That's right. Those three are not in there. All the, all the others are there. Yeah, and it's a census that decides, somewhat arbitrarily, that these are counties where a, a big part of the economy is tied into the, to, to, to the city. Or, and it's not Houston anymore. It's the Houston, Sugarland, Brazoria metropolitan area. That is the... Houston, Houston. Sugarland. Is that Sugar Land Baker? Sugar Land is that the official <laughs> entity? Is that the SMSA? That's the new no. CSMSA CS. from, the, from the census. And, and that's what you need to use. That's area. And, and that area is the fastest growing metropolitan area in the country. Yeah. Well, it's the fastest growing. And the most ethically diverse. And it's really quite striking. So how do we get the respect of the other coasts? We are just hanging there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, the story is all of us love it here and say, why don't the other people recognize how great this is? And, and a big part of it is that the image people have of Houston is not Houston today. It's the, it's the bush country, it's, it's the rodeo, it's, it's tumbleweeds and cactus. Well, in essence, we do have the respect of both coasts and the Midwest, and in that, 100,000 people move here every year. And it's just the it's media changing. interpretation of the views of those that aren't moving <laughs> is what we're uh, faced with changing. And we're making a, a better city. Yeah. We, I think in the last 15 years, watching the city sort of yeah. commit, we, we've spent about 15 point, uh, $4.5 billion in the last 15 years on downtown revitalization, on the state of the art sports venues, on the new opportunity. You know, so, the, uh, and I've asked my students every year, uh, for the last 20 years, if the jobs are the same everywhere, would you want to stay in Houston or would you be eager to, to, to go elsewhere? And overwhelming people say, I want to go elsewhere. Until the last couple of years, more and more of my students have said, gee, I would like to stay in Houston. <coughs> and, that's, and, this, and, and this is a place now where 60% where, uh, now come from outside Texas. And, and Rice University, the freshman class this year was 10% foreign students and a minority of adults, 45% tripping on the ballot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's suddenly, welcome to the 21st century. When it was white, right? Well, well, Charlie was there. When you were in Well, 1968 was the first time they allowed that African American. Break the rule of the land. Yeah, and, and you go back to <clears throat> an incredible racism about immigration laws that said there are three subspecies of the white race. The Nordics, who are biologically much superior to the Alpines, who in turn are superior to the Mediterraneans, <laughs> and all of them are superior to the Jews of the Asians. And the law codified the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Germans of Japan in 1906. This was all in the film they cut out. <laughs> 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 to declare in the Act of 1934, Asians are demonstrably an inferior subspecies of humanity ineligible from ever becoming American citizens. And Asians were banned entirely. Right? Isn't, that was our law. That was us, this racist world of ours in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And we finally changed the law thinking, and we changed the law with absolute confidence, nothing will change. Because the, and I don't know if it's, you saw a part of it, but if you look at, at immigration since from the 1820s to, to 2010, there was this big 15.9 million immigrants coming here between 1890 and 1914, coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, but they weren't Protestants, they were Catholics and Jews. And, and, and that's where that law came, that racist law that was passed. And then no immigration, which after 50 years. Plummeting, and 98% of everybody came, came from Northern Europe, 88%, 99% from Europe, 88% from Northern Europe, but virtually no immigration. In the 1930s and 40s, and we assumed immigration is a thing of the past, but we've got this deeply embarrassing law on the books. We've got to change it. Nothing will change. Uh, and, and, uh, and then, of course, everything changed. And, and we suddenly became a nation of immigrants again. So I tell people before, not surprising that not everybody's entirely happy with this. We have never liked it in America when large numbers of immigrants were in our midst. 
we like the idea of being a nation of immigrants, and we like second and third generation immigrants who are 100% <laughs> <laughs> exotic cultures. We have always believed the last wave of immigration was great for America, this wave is destroying the country. <laughs> and here we are again, suddenly a nation of immigrants, and Houston has never in its history no been a city of immigrants, we're a city of migrants. They can't get to see me, thanks so. So, uh, it's not surprising that, that some of that anti-immigrant fervor is, is still here. But, the, but uh, boy, you know, when I showed that chart of, and I think I've uh, shown you this before, that, that this demographic chart that says, where would we have been had Houston not been one of the great magnets of the new immigration in the last 30 years? The answer is, Houston would have lost population. We would have, we would have had the same fate as other major American cities across the country that are losing their status as major cities. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, St. Louis, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Buffalo, major American cities that are losing their status because they have stopped growing. Houston is instead one of those vibrant, rapidly growing cities in America, tremendous entrepreneurial economy, the first, last nation to go into recession, last city to go into recession, first one to come out, purely because of the truth. Tremendous energy, vitality, optimism, commitment to hard work of immigrants pouring into the city from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. No city has benefited more from immigration than Houston, Texas. So it is ironic to see the anti immigrant attitudes there as you just think about what a different story we'd be talking about this time. Had we not been this incredible magnet for the you know, I really like the um, early photos of you uh, not going where you were. I think my, my question is, what, where do you see the Kinder Institute headed in the survey's future? In particular, methodology. Do you think there'll be a change uh, with now that you're doing the Tate County area? Is there a future where it's not a home based survey, it's a larger field? Yeah, those are great uh, questions. Compiling the 31 years into compendium documents. See, things were so much easier in the old days. In yeah, the yeah. early 80s, no one had these horrible things like caller ID or answering machines. <laughs> one phone, every, everybody answered the phone. And then once you get a human being on the phone, you tell them we're calling from Ice University, right? I tell them we have the computer that gives us random number. And we're going to interesting survey. Won't you help us in the conical? We kind of focus. Almost always the people say, OK, what do you want to know? And then no one breaks up. Our problem now is we can't get people to ask the telephone, right? And, 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 we, and, and so many people have, we think about 30% of all households in Houston have no landline at all. And so if we do 30% of the phones are random phone numbers serving cell phones, and 70% are random numbers serving landlines. Uh, and and we, we do the best we possibly can, and then of course we wait the data at the end so that it's solidly reflective of the, of the population. Uh, but I don't know if you know, 20 years from now, no one's going to have landlines. We're going to have, have, we'll have cell phones that are sort of uh, implanted in our, in our <laughs> you know, we'll, 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 uh, and one thought is to do multimodal things to say, we'll put it here, here, here it is online, we can email, we can send it to you. I'm nervous about that because if I, I imagine somebody saying, here, 15 year old kid, you fill this out. You know, whereas on the telephone, you can really talk to the person. And, and, uh, but we're committed to, I can't imagine a world without survey research. <laughs> and we're working with the best people in the country. To, you know, one of the best techniques as we move forward, and we will move to multimodal things, I think. There's an address-based sampling is much more expensive. It takes longer, but seems to be a little bit better where you, where you write to somebody and say, here's what's coming, and would you help us and you include a $2 bill? Apparently it's a great yeah. $2 Jefferson bill. Yeah. People say, ooh, yeah. important guys here. <laughs> so we're, we're but, but the Kinder Institute is committed to having a permanent home. I have two uh, um, 